comments, I'd like to go into the sermon. And I've given a few sermons already about some of the aspects of the armor of God. And of course, you find those described in Ephesians chapter 6. And even though you know them all by heart, don't you? We still want to quickly go to it again, Ephesians chapter 6, where several aspects are described, all being part of the armor of God, which we need to conquer and fight Satan, the devil, and his demons, and his servants, and his ministers, and all his instruments, which are being used to try to destroy us. And so in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul is saying, and take the helmet of salvation, and that one we have already covered in a previous sermon, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So today I want to talk about the fact that we have to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And there are certain aspects we need to understand when we look into that particular passage. It's talking about the sword, all right, but it's a sword of the Spirit, which means it is not a physical sword which we as true Christians ought to take. In fact, as we will see from a few examples now, the physical sword is many times associated with a curse, a curse from God. Notice, for instance, in Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27, and of course, there we read about the fact that Isaac blessed Jacob after Esau had disqualified himself from being the one who should receive the birthright. And then, of course, Jacob tricked Isaac and he received the blessing, and then Edom came, Esau, and he wanted the blessing too. And so, in verse 40, here is the quote unquote blessing which Isaac gives him doesn't quite sound like a blessing, sounds more like a curse, because this is what he says. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. Well, and then at the end, there is a little bit of a blessing here. It shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. But first, it was a statement that he would live or it says here, live by his sword, and that he would serve his brother. Now, thinking in terms of what Christ later said to Peter, if you take the sword, you shall die by the sword. And so that is very true prophetically for the descendants of Esau or Edom. They have always been a very violent people. And there are certain passages in the Old Testament giving prophecies about Edom and Edom's future. And God is not going to be very kind towards them due to their violence and their treachery. Now, also notice another passage in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49, and in verse 5, here's another prophecy about, in this case, Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi showed themselves to be very brutal, very cruel, very treacherous. And notice what Jacob is saying. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. Now, in the margin, it says violence for cruelty. Instruments of violence. And the Luther Bible, for instance, translates, their swords are murderous weapons. Again, doesn't sound like a very great blessing. It's more like a curse. Because he goes on to say in verse 6, let not my soul enter their counsel. In other words, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Let not my honor be united in their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. And of course, if you read the story, they did an awful lot more than that. So it wasn't a blessing, and the point is, the physical sword will never help us. Taking the physical sword will never lead to any constructive consequence. Remember Christ's words, you'll take the sword, you'll die by it. You will perish by it. 
Notice a few scriptures in Psalm 44. Psalm 44. And let's look at verse 6. Psalm 44 and verse 6. Here are the sons of Korah. See, Korah, the one who rebelled, and rebelled, I should say, against Moses, and he died, but not all his children died, because not everybody was involved in this rebellion. And so here are the sons of Korah, saying, For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies, and have put to shame those who hated us. So they say, we will not trust in our sword, in our physical sword. And we find that message over and over. Hosea chapter 1, for instance. Hosea chapter 1 and in verse 7. Hosea chapter 1 and verse 7, here is a prophecy. That is how God will help his people. How will he do it? Well, it says, Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. I will save them by the Lord their God, and I will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle. Human swords, human bows will not help the house of Judah, or by horses or horsemen. All this big equipment we might be having, even when it talks about the house of Israel, and our willingness to go to war and to fight wars, it's not going to help us. In fact, it will destroy us. Notice an interesting passage in Joshua chapter 24. Because some say, yeah, but God actually did use the Israelites to fight wars and to bring them into the promised land. Yes and no. Yes and no. Because God made it very clear he didn't need them. And it was never his intent for them to fight to begin with. Now, they made that decision. And then God used them to bring about his purpose. But it was never his will that they would do so. Notice how God says he got the Israelites into the promised land. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 12. He says, I sent the hornets before you, which drove them out from before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword, or with your bow, he said, well, don't even think that because you were so great in your war tactics that you got the promised land there, why? No, he said, no. It was totally useless what you did. I did it. And notice 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and in verse 47. That's an interesting Scripture, which should also be read very carefully by all the members of the Church of God today. Because I dare to say that some have still not gotten the point. Notice what he says. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And if we go to war and God is not on our side, it's totally useless. Totally useless. So the point is, God doesn't save us with our war machines. To take the physical sword is tantamount to being under a curse. The time will come, and you read about this in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4, when people get to the point where they understand that. And then they will beat their swords into plowshares. And then they will not learn war anymore. And then all these war academies will be a thing of the past. And those who are going to war today, who are soldiers, they will finally get to the point where they do something constructive, something helpful, something peaceful, something lasting. As I said, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 52, Christ makes this very point clear. The ones who take the sword shall perish by the sword. You know, I'd like to turn with you to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, and in verse 12, because a prophecy is made here 
about Jesus Christ. At the time when he was arrested, just before he was arrested, including his arrest, including his dying on the cross. Isaiah 53 and verse 12, it says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Christ was numbered with the transgressors. goes on to say he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors. Now, did you know that that passage is quoted twice in the New Testament in two different contexts? The one is in Luke chapter 22. That's the one which I want to emphasize now. Luke 22. And let's start reading in verse 36. Luke 22 and verse 36. And then he said to them, his disciples, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a sack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you, that this which is written must still be accompanied in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And then they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, how does this fit with the prophecy in Isaiah? How was he numbered amongst the transgressors? Well, think about the fact when they came to arrest him. And here were people, disciples having swords. And Peter takes one. At that moment, they were the transgressors. And so Christ was numbered amongst the transgressors. In order to fulfill that prophecy, they had to have swords. And so that's why Christ tells them, to take them. But to use them was transgression. Transgression against the law of God and the law of man. Now the other passage, you can look at this later, is in Mark chapter 15, in verses 27 to 28. There that scripture is quoted in reference to the robbers who were crucified as Christ. So in two different ways is this scripture applied in the New Testament. But the point I want to make is that it is God who is our sword. He is our protection. And in Deuteronomy chapter 33, let me just say that some have used the scripture in Luke to try to justify that we should buy swords to go and go to war with them. Just the opposite is true. Just the opposite is true. If you do it, you become a transgressor, is what Christ is saying. But here in Deuteronomy chapter 33, Notice what it says in verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 29. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. And your enemies shall submit to you, and you shall tread down their high places. Notice what it says about God. God is the shield and the sword which actually has to be understood in this way, because we are to take that sword of the Spirit. Now, where do we take it from? Well, we are taking it from God. How? Because God is that sword, and he can give it to us. But it's a sword of the Spirit. It is not a physical sword. And how is that sword of the Spirit defined? In the Bible. Notice first Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 2. This is what Isaiah is saying. And of course, apparently referring here to Jesus Christ. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. And in the shadow of his hand he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft, and in his quiver he has hidden me. The sword is referred to here and associated with the mouth of Jesus Christ. Perhaps to a minor extent also Isaiah the prophet. And again, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, the scripture which Cain Mitchell quoted in the sermonette. But let's read it again in this context, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12.
Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is a living, notice carefully, a living and powerful, or is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, God's word is even sharper, it says here, than any two-edged sword. It can convince us, it can convict us of things we are trying to hide, perhaps, of sins we are still carrying around with us. Notice Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. But always remember the context we're talking about. We're talking about taking the sword of the Spirit. Right? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16. Here again, Jesus Christ is defined and described. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Out of his mouth. We're not talking about a physical sword here. It's coming out of his mouth. It's coming out of what he is saying. Notice also in chapter 2 and in verse 16. Revelation 2 and verse 16. Repent. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them. How? With the sword of my mouth. That's how Christ is going to deal with the rebels. Through what he is going to say. And also notice in chapter 19. And in verse 15. Revelation 19 and verse 15. That is when Jesus Christ returns. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Again, we are talking about the sword of the Spirit as related to what's coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Now, when we take that sword of the Spirit, then we have to look at what's coming out of our mouth. Do we give words of war, of condemnation, as we heard in the sermonette today, of condemnation, judging others, but not judging ourselves? What is coming out of our mouth is a question. Now, of course, Christ did say something in Matthew chapter 10. And again, as so many times, people who do not understand the Bible misinterpret this passage. Matthew chapter 10, and in verse 34. Matthew 10 and verse 34. What's Christ saying here? Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Uh -huh. So is he advocating warfare? Is he saying that we as true Christians should take the sword and kill other people? He goes on to say, For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. Verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who doesn't take his cross and follow me after, his, uh, after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it, and he who lo loses his life for my sake We'll find it. What's he talking about? Again, he's talking about the Word, the Word of God, that Word of the Spirit. That's what divides. We are not the ones who are dividing us from others. It's they who do not accept and understand what God's Word is all about. And the conflict comes because we are now going God's way, and others, maybe those in our own household, don't want to. They are the ones who are causing the division, not the other way around. And Christ is saying, the sword he is bringing, that's God's word. And God's word separates. If we are willing, as we will see in a moment, to follow it without compromise. 
that we are told to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And how can we do that? How can we take the Word of the Spirit? Well, we can only take the Word of the Spirit if we receive the Word through God's Holy Spirit. To put it differently, we have to be led by God's Holy Spirit in order to be able to use the sword of the Spirit. Remember when Jesus Christ was in the wilderness and Satan came to tempt him. How did Christ conquer Satan? He quoted God's word to him. And then, of course, Satan also started to quote God's word, but he twisted it all around, like he always does, and like his ministers always do. But then Christ came right back and told him, no, 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 you are misinterpreting the scripture. This is what it says. And he kept, again, conquering him by using the word of God in a proper and right way. And we must do likewise. You see, remember, Christ was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be even tempted by Satan. This was all part of God's plan. But Christ knew how to conquer Satan. Do we know how to conquer Satan? Do we know God's word enough that we can live it, as we'll see in a moment? Live it. Not just talk about it, but actually do it. First notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 3. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking, listen, by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, what does he mean? He means you recognize Jesus Christ as your Lord because the Holy Spirit gives you that understanding. And what it means is you obey him. If you call him Lord, you obey him. Otherwise, you don't call him Lord in the right way. You know, Christ says, many call me Lord. Why you call me Lord and don't do what I tell you? No, only by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit do you understand that Jesus Christ is your Lord, your master, whom you have to obey in everything. And so then you are not going to look at Jesus Christ and call him accursed, call him somebody whom we don't have to have any close connection with. No, you see, you have to have the Holy Spirit, or at least the Holy Spirit has to work with you in order to come to that understanding that you have to obey Christ. And that's why the vast majority of people today don't obey Christ. They just don't because they are not empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. And the carnal mind is enmity against God, as we read, and it cannot be obedient to God. It, it can't. It doesn't want to, and it can't, because only the Holy Spirit can give you that power. Notice Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and verse 36. Look at the context, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And as we are pointing out now, is that we speak through the Spirit. Or better yet, the Holy Spirit inspires us to say certain words. Verse 36, David himself said, by the Holy Spirit. So it was the Holy Spirit inspiring David to make this statement here. And here's the statement. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Your, your, fool, your, your footstool, sorry, your footstool. And therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is it he then his son? And they common people heard him gladly. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they wouldn't want to answer this because there was a problem, right? Christ makes it very clear he was the son of God. He also makes it very clear that God consists of two beings, the Father and the Son, always has been. That's something the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't want to believe, didn't want to teach. People today don't believe and teach it either. The point is, 
David said that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 2. He says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. Again, the same context. It was God's Spirit inspiring David to say certain things. When we take the Spirit, or the sword of the Spirit, which is the work of God, that means God's Spirit is inspiring us to say the right things in a certain situation. Notice Mark chapter 13. Mark 13 and verse 11. When they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Well, the people still speak, but they are speaking not their own words, you see. They are speaking what the Holy Spirit is inspiring them to say. Because they have been taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that has always been the case for God's people. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. It says, Prophecy never came by the will of man. Now the Holy Spirit is also a spirit of prophecy. But the word prophecy here can also mean inspired speaking. Either way, it never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit inspired them to say these things. Notice an interesting example in Acts chapter 4 and in verse 31. Acts chapter 4 and in verse 31. And when they had prayed... The place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke. What? The word of God. How? With boldness. You see, they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they had prayed to God for it, and then because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they can speak the word of God, and they could do it with boldness. Now, if you take one of this away, then they couldn't speak the word of God with boldness. They probably would speak their own words. They had to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, that is why, and that's the only reason why, the Bible sometimes talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit speaks. Now, some people say, oh, that means the Holy Spirit is a person. No, it's not. The Holy Spirit is a power, the mind emanating from the Father and the Son, something which can be in you. It's not a person, see, but the person, an individual, speaks because he or she is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so notice in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, Revelation 14 and verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. By the way, in the Lord always means that the Holy Spirit of the Father and of Jesus Christ is within you. Every time you read that expression, in the Lord, so you marry in the Lord, that means you marry as a Christian another Christian. And a Christian is somebody in whom Christ's Spirit dwells. Here they die in the Lord. Blessed are they. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. In other words, the Holy Spirit is inspiring this to be written down. It is God through his Spirit inspiring it. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is a person. 
We've got to understand the context. First Timothy chapter 4, it's the same thing. We already read that it was David inspired by the Holy Spirit saying these words. Here in First Timothy chapter 4, another example. In verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says how? Well, in that people were inspired through the Holy Spirit to make those comments. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. A falling away is still going to come. A falling away from the truth in the latter times. They will depart from the faith. Giving heed to deceiving spirits. See, they are not conquering Satan. They are not conquering the demons. They are not conquering those deceiving spirits by using the armor of God, by having taken the sword of the Spirit, which is the work of God. Now they have come up with all kinds of other ideas. And so now they are giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Speaking lies. And not only that, in hypocrisy. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Past repentance, you see have come to the point where you cannot reach their conscience anymore. They have fallen away totally from the Word of God. Now, the next sermon I'm going to give, whenever that's going to be, I am going to speak about the sin against the Holy Spirit. You can also refer to that as the unpardonable sin. Let me just say, it is a process. That's where it ends. That's not where it starts. The warnings in the Bible are very clear not to even start on this wrong way which may lead to the unpardonable sin. Here we have a classic example of somebody who apparently has reached that point. They have seared their conscience with a hot iron, can't be reached anymore, speaking lies and hypocrisy, falling away from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. But it's the Holy Spirit which says that. In other words, the Holy Spirit inspired, in this case, Paul, to write these things down. The sword of the Spirit doesn't kill. The sword of the Spirit makes you alive. You read about the living Word of God. Notice John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and in verse 63. John chapter 6 and verse 63. It is the Spirit which gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. And they are life. What does it mean to us when we take the sword of the Spirit, which is supposed to give life? It means that we are giving words and speaking words which are encouraging, which are making other people alive, spiritually speaking. We find a very nice passage here in John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. Again, are we quick to condemn others while we ourselves probably suffer from bigger problems, but we don't see those, we only see the problems of others. Notice John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39. Christ says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, which those believing in him would receive. For the Spirit, the Holy Spirit wasn't given yet, because Jesus Christ wasn't yet glorified. Of course, we ultimately understand this is a much broader concept here, but for the purpose of the sermon today, it's also talking about the fact what's coming out of our heart should be something which makes other people alive, which is refreshing to them, which is helpful to them, which is encouraging to them. Now, sometimes, of course, harsh words have to be given if people just are not listening, but that is not where we start. Of course, Mr. Harris in the Q&A this week did talk about the fact that even there might come a time where people will have to be disfellowshipped from the Church of God because of their unrepentant conduct. 
but he will also give a subsequent Q&A, which is going to be published this coming week, where he's going to talk about receiving them back upon repentance. See, these two things go together. But now notice the fact that the sword of the Spirit is also a spirit of prayer. We read about earlier that the people were praying and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But now look at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. And let's notice verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And the word for supplication can, of course, also mean prayer. In fact, supplication is a very earnest, strong prayer. So God will pour out that spirit of supplication and of grace, of unmerited favor and unmerited pardon. The point is God has to pour it out. He is offering to us that sword of the Spirit. We have to take it. We have to use it. We have to use that Spirit which God is pouring out upon us already today, which he is going to do in a much broader way when Christ returns, because the context is very clear. It's talking about his return. See, then they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Then they will realize and understand what they have done, that because of their sins, Christ died for them individually, as he did for all of us. We all know the scripture in John chapter 4 and verse 24, which tells us that we have to worship God in the spirit and in truth. God is a spirit being. We have to worship him, him in spirit, because we have received the sword of the Spirit, which God is giving us. But we have to also do it in truth. And that's important to understand because it is the Spirit of truth which God is giving us. Notice this in John chapter 15. You cannot worship God in truth if you don't have God's Spirit of truth within you, or at least if God's spirit of truth hasn't started working with you. In John 15 and verse 26, But when the Helper comes, which I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, it will testify of me. See, we have to receive the spirit of truth. And so in chapter 16, and in verse 13 we read, however, when it, the spirit of truth, has come, it will guide you into all truth. See, we don't receive the fullness of the truth right away. We have to be guided into all truth, for it will not speak on its own authority, but whatever it hears, it will speak and it will tell you things to come. As I said, it's a spirit of prophecy as well. Now, the way that's worded in the New King James, it always talks about he when it talks about the Holy Spirit. Of course, that's totally wrong. In the Greek, it doesn't say he. It says it. And this is a figurative language, as Christ himself later says. So it is worded in such a way that it personifies the Holy Spirit in this context, but it's not a person. It is not a person, and of course, there are many, many proofs which I can give you, and we have a booklet out there that the Holy Spirit is not a person, we have one on is God eternity. We have another booklet, God is a family. So this is just figurative language. But the point is, it's a spirit of truth which God is giving you. And that spirit of truth encourages us, empowers us, enables us to speak the word of truth, to speak God's word of truth. That's why when we take the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, we can speak the word of God in truth. And how is that? Well, because God's word is truth. And I shouldn't take too much time to go there because we should all know this, but let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. Because even though we might know this theoretically, 
If we are in a given situation, do we really then understand it fully that no matter what the situation, God word, God's word is truth, which means if God tells you to do something, it is always right, no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance. Now, some have concluded it's not always right. There have got to be other ways. There have got to be alternatives. No, there are no alternatives. Second Samuel chapter 7 and verse 28. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servants. Even though it might not at that time or prior to the statement here by David, it might not have appeared that way. But David had the absolute confidence that God's word is always true. And so notice 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 15. Of course here, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is saying this foremost to the evangelist Timothy. And of course, when I read those passages, I'm taking them very personally myself. And this is what it says. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Dividing the word of truth. Think of the word of God sharper than any two-edged sword and dividing body and soul. See, the word of truth divides, does away with what's wrong, and adopts what's right. And that's what we have to pass on, the ministry of God, have to pass that on to the membership. And when we preach on the internet and whatever, to the whole world, those who want to listen. Not to be ashamed of God's word. Not to try to compromise because it didn't sound too good. Well, well, we should say that God is a family. Oh, no, no, no. That's, you mean we should say that we, we are supposed to become God beings? Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Don't go that far. That, that, that's going to be offensive. No. You say with all boldness, without compromise, without holding back, the word of God. Now, that means our message has to be including words of truth and reason. When I say reason, I mean they have to be sound, the words we speak. Acts 26. You know, here Paul was on trial, and he was talking to the governor, and the governor thought, you're crazy, Paul, what you're telling me here. Nonsense. And notice Paul's response. Acts 26 and verse 25 was actually the king to whom Paul spoke here, King Agrippa. And Paul says, I'm not mad. Oh, no, there actually was the governor, most noble Festus. Agrippa came later. I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. I speak the words of truth and reason. Sound words. Not fanatic words, not unbalanced words. Now, words of truth and reason. But that's what we've got to do. And especially the ministry. First Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. If anyone speaks, now that is pretty broad, isn't it? If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles or the sayings or the words of God. Don't give your own opinion on things. All speculations. Just this morning I received a memo from somebody, I hasten to add outside the Church of God, who had come up with some kind of a prophecy by somebody according to which Jesus Christ is going to come back 2017. Now I don't know how he got that. He even gives me all kinds of links, YouTube links of some kind of quote unquote self proclaimed prophets who were right in the past on certain things. And so it's all a bunch of nonsense. You see? Perhaps. This is something which was inspired by demons. I don't know. All I know is that Christ says you don't know the year. Don't try to figure it out. 
No, we are speaking the words of God and not words made up in our own minds, which are contrary to the words of God. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Preach the word. Paul says again here to Timothy, preach the word. What word? The word of God. How can he do it? Well, because he took the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. God's Holy Spirit was dwelling in him mightily and powerfully, so he could preach the word. He goes on to say, be ready in season, out of season. Convince. Rebuke when there is a need. Rebuke. Exhort. But do it with all long suffering and do it with teaching. Of course, then he goes on to say, because the time will come and they will not endure sound doctrines anymore. And we'll come to that in a moment. But for now, we are asked upon to preach the word of God, to be ready in season, out of season, and to convince, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and with the right kind of teaching. And notice also in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, and notice in verse 7. Remember those, Paul is saying here to the congregation of the Hebrews, remember those who rule over you. Wow, that's a bad word, isn't it? Rule over you. Oh, we don't want to say that. Of course, the meaning is leading. You know, we are leading them. We are showing them God's word because that's what he says. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. Whose faith follow. Considering the outcome of their conduct. You know, we don't want to put ourselves on a higher position in which we are. But it is important for us, and especially for the ministry here, and of course that's the ones Paul is addressing, that those who are leading the congregation, of course, and he's addressing the congregation insofar as what their relationship to the ministry should be. But it's important for us that we are giving good examples. And that we have the kind of faith in God and his word in whatever circumstance we might be, because the congregation is asked upon to follow that faith. It has not been a secret, it's never been a secret, that one of the biggest problems in the Church of God, and always has been, as long as I can remember, and some of you having been in the Church even longer than I have, probably as long as you can remember, one of the biggest problems in the Church has always been marriage problems. Now, when my wife and I got married, we made a commitment to God. And that commitment was, no matter what, we would know there would be high waves, there would be winds, there would be hurricanes, there would be tornadoes, and what have you. This is for life. We made this promise to God in front of witnesses. In Germany, of course, we were first married in front of a magistrate, that's the law over there. And then after that, we were married in the church. Divorce was never an issue for us. It's very important that this kind of a commitment, when it's made, is being kept, no matter what the problems might be. Now, that is not to say that divorce might not be legitimate in certain circumstances. Right? I mean, we have certain examples in the Bible. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that as long as we stay faithful to God, and I can say that about my wife and myself, and I believe you can attest to that, divorce is never an issue. Now, problems might be there. You got to work them out. See, but this is just one example. And those of you who might be looking at us, perhaps having marriage problems, and I'm speaking to all of you who might be listening in from wherever country you might be living in from, make sure you stick to your words, to your commitments, which you made to God and to each other. And work it out. Work it out. It can be worked out. With God's help, it's possible. But you have to take 
the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you have to believe God. And when he says that marriage is for life, you need to know, yes, it is going to be for life, and I will work it out with my mate. Notice the fact that God's Word has to be given to us. God has to give it to you. Notice in Psalm 68, Psalm 68 and verse 11. Psalm 68 and verse 11. So the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. You see, the company of those who proclaimed it could only uh, uh, proclaim it because God gave the word to them. Now, there are far too many today who want to proclaim what they think is God's word, and it's not God's word at all, because God hasn't given it to them. And so in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 19, Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 19, Paul says, pray for me. Pray for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul is saying, pray for me so that I can do this, so that the utterance of what I need to say is going to be given to me and so that I can proclaim it boldly. Paul knew without God's help, without God's spirit within him, which would work mightily within him, he could never do the job. And quite frankly, all the ministers should know that, and I most certainly know that. And so that's why we keep asking all of you to pray for us. I would add, on a daily basis. Notice John chapter 3 and verse 34. John chapter 3 and in verse 34. Now, of course, even though John the Baptist speaks about Jesus Christ here, I'd like to also apply it to anyone who is put by God into this position as being part of the ordained ministry. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. See, if God doesn't send ministers, they don't speak the word of God. They may speak their own imaginations. John chapter 7, and in verse 16. John chapter 7, and verse 16. Even Jesus answered and said, My doctrine isn't mine, but his who sent me. How much more should that be true for us? We shouldn't come up with all kinds of wrong ideas and speculations and doctrines if they are not in agreement with what God says in his word. But if we say what God says in his word, then we can be confident that God sent us to say those things and gave us the understanding to say those things. But that also means that we have to accept what God is offering. God is offering us a sword of the Spirit. We have to take it. Notice the attitude in this particular example in Acts chapter 17 and in verse 11. Very famous passage, Acts 17 and verse 11. These, of course, it's people in Berea, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. Fair-minded, literally noble. In that they received the word with all readiness. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out that those things were not so. That's how some read it, right? That's not, that's not what it says. Just the opposite. They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so, or better not, Better still, that those things were so. They were not trying to disprove Paul. No, they received the words, but they still checked up on him to make sure that what he said could be proven from Scripture. But it was the attitude of wanting to know. It wasn't the attitude of rejecting what was being said, as we find this attitude today so prevalent. Everybody wants to reject God's word so that they can uphold their own traditions, their own ideas. Now, we have to accept God's word with all readiness. 
Notice a very important passage in John chapter 8 and in verse 47. John chapter 8 and in verse 47. This is what Christ is saying. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God, he tells to the people who were listening. Now, that's a very important principle. If we are of God, if God's Spirit dwells within us, we will hear, we will accept God's words. If God's Spirit doesn't dwell within us, then we will not. And so that is what we read in Jeremiah chapter 13. And in verse 10, Jeremiah 13, and in verse 10, a prophecy for us today. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, they shall be just like this sash which is profitable for nothing. You know, people don't want to hear God's word. They want to do their own thing. They want to keep Halloween like last night. They want to keep Christmas. They want to keep Easter. They most certainly don't want to keep the Sabbath or the holy days. God calls them evil people. Evil people who refuse to hear God's words. Also notice Another interesting passage in John chapter 8 and verse 7. I'm sorry, John chapter 8 and verse 37. John chapter 8 and verse 37. That's what Jesus told his audience at his time. He says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants physically, but you seek to kill me because my word there's no place in you. We have to ask ourselves the question, does God's word have place in us? Do God's words have place in us? Because if it doesn't, if God's words don't, then we can easily get to the point we read about earlier. Falling away, listening to deceiving spirits, and becoming people whose conscience is seared without iron. Notice Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13 and verse 13. He who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Like again, we heard in the sermonette today, there are automatic blessings and penalties involved here, blessings and cursings. You follow God's command, you will reap blessings. You despise God's commands, you will reap curses up to the point of destruction. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 24. Isaiah 5 and verse 24. Therefore, as a fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And he says, therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. And on and on, the curse is gone. It all boils down to, are we willing to accept God's word or not? That's the first step. Because we might hear God's word. We might even agree with it, generally. But then notice what may happen in Mark chapter 8 and in verse 38. Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. Christ says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. See, 
in a time of temptation, in the time of trial, in the time of persecution, some, if not many, will become ashamed of Christ's words, don't want to quite follow, are willing to compromise because they don't want to lose maybe their maid or their parents or their children or their job or whatever the case may be. But Christ warns us and he says, no, if you do that, then I will be ashamed of you when I return. And so we are told in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 to be very careful that we take great note of God's word. In other words, to take the sword of the spirit, which is God's word, and to use it. Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 1. Therefore, Paul says, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Other translations have, lest we fall away, because that's what he's talking about. We have to give even the more earnest heed to what we have heard, and we hopefully have heard in God's church the word of God, but we can lose it if you're not careful. It can drift away. And so we have to not only accept it, we have to do it. Of course, the very famous passage, James chapter 1 and in verse 22. James chapter 1 and verse 22. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Oh, yeah, I have the knowledge of the Sabbath. I have the knowledge of the Holy Days. I have the knowledge of how to love my neighbor. I have the knowledge of how to love God. Well, do we do it? It's a question. Or when temptation comes, when trial comes, when difficulties come, are we willing to compromise and say, oh, well, you know, I still can break the Sabbath a little bit here, and I don't really have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles for the entire time. I just do it for a few days like the Jews do today, just the first two days and the last two days, that's all I need to do. Whereas God says, keep it for the entire time. You see, again, it's a question of how much are we willing to be doers of the word. How much are we willing to take that sword of the Spirit and use it in our lives? And so, it has a lot to do with faith. It has a lot to do with how we live. See, Christ says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word which comes out of the mouth of God. And Matthew 4 and verse 4 tells you that. But you have to live by faith. Even in times where it looks to be pretty grim, right? But notice in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 6 to 8. Romans chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. See, that word of faith, the absolute total conviction that we can do, that we must do, whatever God tells us, that should be in our heart and, of course, then in our mouth. And our reaction towards these temptations from Satan will determine whether we are going to conquer Satan or not. We are to take the spiritual sword of the word of God and that means we have to fight for the faith. But we have to fight it in a spiritual way, not physically. Notice Philippians chapter 1. It is a fight. It is a fight with Satan, the devil, his instruments to maintain, to keep the faith when he brings us those darts of doubt. But notice Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, 
so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit. One spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Not being divided, going with all kinds of doctrines, having divisions, striving together with one mind for the faith of the gospel. It's what Paul is writing them, even though he wasn't there. He said, but I am there in the spirit, and I hope that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. How can we do this? How can we fight together with one mind for the faith in the Spirit? Well, because we do have, don't we, the Spirit of faith. Notice this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Since we have it, let's use it. Let's use it specifically when we are in trials. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 13. But since we have the same spirit of faith, all of us, he says, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore we speak. You can't say God's words unless you believe in them. You cannot preach to others what you yourself don't believe. You see, whether you are a minister or whether you are not a minister, it doesn't matter. You talk to someone, you tell this person something, you better believe that what you are saying is correct and that it is the word of God and that God's word is true. You see, when we use the word of God as a spiritual sword, then we can conquer Satan then we can conquer his attempts to discourage us, to conquer us, to fight against us. And then we can become bolder and bolder to stand up to Satan and his devices. In Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 14. Most of the brethren in the Lord, he says, in the Lord, in other words, they have God's Spirit, having become confident by my chains, see, Paul is writing this while in prison, they are much more bold now to speak the word without fear. See, they see Paul, that great example. He is in prison. He is not buckling. He is not compromising. He is not ashamed of God's word. He is preaching the word. And so the disciples look at that and say, well, let's do the same thing. And so they became, as it said, much more bold to speak the word without fear. But in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with a warning. I mentioned earlier that Paul is warning us, that the Bible is warning us not to drift away, not to fall away from the truth. Some, perhaps many, will still do that. They have been doing it recently, as we know, going back to the days of the collapse of the Worldwide Church of God, and the falling away is continuing. In Amos chapter 8, we find a very telling and, in a sense, sobering warning. Amos. Notice Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Now, does this mean that the time will come where the church will not preach any longer the word of God? No, it doesn't mean that, because that will always be preached. The two witnesses will come. They will preach the word of God. Christ even says, you know, you do your job, and you won't even be finished 
with all the houses and all the cities of Israel until I come. No, it's talking about people who will not recognize the word of God anymore because their conscience is seared. They are looking for the word of God, but they can't find it anymore because they have fallen away so far from God that they don't recognize anymore the word of God even when it's presented to them. And here in Hosea chapter 5, you find this very clearly explained. Hosea chapter 5 and verse 6. We have to be very careful that we don't fall into that category. That when the word of God is proclaimed to us, we reject it. We resist it. Because then God will take it away from us. And he will take away from us the understanding as to what God's word is all about. And that is why so many people today who once knew about the Sabbath, who once knew about the Holy Days, have no comprehension anymore today what it's all about. Don't keep it anymore. And when somebody tells them about it, they laugh and they scorn and they say, oh, well, you still keep that stuff? Hosea chapter 5 and verse 6. In conclusion, God is telling all of us, with their flocks and herds, even with all their belongings, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. And they have dealt treacherously with the Lord, for they have begotten pagan children. In other words, no longer those who are raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Those who are children of parents who have fallen away. And of course, now a new moon shall devour them and their heritage. That will be the conclusion of the matter for those. We pray, we have to be very careful, but we pray that it doesn't apply to us. But the warning is there. Let's not make a mistake thinking that it will go on forever like we have today where we have relative peace. Now, times will be tough. Times will be very difficult. All of us will be tested. Now is the time to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with which we can and must conquer and defeat Satan and his instruments. Mm -hmm.